Good evening. Welcome to this, library, this forum for the Rochester Hills Library Board election. Today is September 20th, 2023. This forum will be featuring the five candidates who have filed for the Rochester Hills Library Board. Vote for two for a six-year term. Sponsors of this forum are the League of Women Voters, Oakland area. I am Judy Bateman, a member of the League of Women Voters. I am not a resident of this district. The League of Women Voters is a trusted national nonpartisan political organization. Our members do the hands-on work to safeguard democracy. While we never endorse a candidate, we are directly involved in shaping the important issues that keep our community strong. As a League of Women Voters member, I have the opportunity to contribute in a leadership role such as this that has great impact on local, state, and even national issues. If you are interested in learning about how you can make a similar impact, I would encourage you to pick up uh, a membership form that I have with me tonight. Or you also can visit our website, lwvoa.org. The League of Women Voters, again, does not endorse any candidate or political party. Views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and the sponsors take no responsibility. The format for this, f for this forum has been established by the League of Women Voters. We ask the audience to remain silent during the forum. Please turn off all cell phones. We ask that candidates answer the question with their views only and not interrupt another candidate. The questions are asked to all candidates and do not single out any one candidate. This presentation is copyrighted 2023 by the League of Women Voters. All rights are reserved. This, this video can only be shown in its entirety. No part of this can be taken out. All candidates will be answering questions submitted by the audience and screened for duplication and appropriateness by Shelley Gatch Droz. Pages will be circulating through the room and if you want to ask a question, raise your hand and they'll give you a card. Or if you want your question picked up, raise your hand. The format is as follows. All candidates will be given one minute for opening statements in alphabetical order. Closing statements will be in reverse, what, one minute in reverse order. Candidates will have one minute to answer each question in rotation unless extended by the moderator. All candidates will be allowed equal time to answer questions. Our time is, I forgot your name. Pat Kish. Pat Kish. I had someone, Pat Kish, thank you. I'm just, she's a new member and I just met her. Okay, the candidates are Terry Hetrick, Madge o Lawson, Pamela Olson, Chuck Stouffer, Harper West. We will begin the one minute opening statements with Ms. Hetrick. Good evening, I'm Terry Hetrick. I'm excited to be running as a candidate for the Board of Trustees. The public library is such an important part of our city and the surrounding areas as well. It is a community center that serves all members of our very diverse community and needs to be able to continue to do so going forward. I have lived in Rochester Hills for 29 years and raised two children. Spending time at the library was an important part of their growing years for entertainment and education. I've worked for 25 years for Rochester Community Schools as an educator. Throughout my career, I have worked with many children, helping them with reading, writing, and math. I've seen firsthand the positive impact that finding themselves in books has on children. I've spent 24 years with the Authors in April program with 20 years on their board of directors. I believe these experiences will help me bring a unique perspective to the board of trustees. I want to be part of making sure that the board of tr trustees continues to support the mission of the library staff as they empower people to explore and create with resources that enlighten, educate, entertain, and inform. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lawson. Good evening. I'm Madge Lawson, current president of the Library Board of Trustees. I'm seeking a re-election to continue the support of our library's mission and your right to read. I've been a Rochester Hills resident since 1982. I have a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Michigan. I spent most of my career in promotion, first as a radio and television writer, and later as public relations director at two hospitals. Before joining the library board, I was on the Friends Board for 14 years. I was the Friends Volunteer of the Year in 1993. I've been a trustee since 1996. I've held many officer positions. I've helped launch our bookmobile service, among our other achievements. I'm currently acting committee chair for the library's centennial celebration next year. Join me in supporting our library's mission to serve our community and to protect your right to read. Vote to re-elect me on November 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Olson. Good evening. 
I thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. I have to admit, I'm a little bit scared <laughs> to be here. Um, although I've been a volunteer at the OPC 650 Players since 2018, this is a whole new audience. So, everyone here has a diverse background with different qualifications. Here are a few of mine that pertain to being on the library board. I do have a master's degree. I'm a veteran 30-year science teacher. I've served in private schools and public schools. I'm personally proud of a few things. I started the robotics team at Athens High School. I grew the AP biology program from five to 75 students. As an adopt-a-stream adopt team leader for the Clinton water, rip, Watershed, um, my students and I got in the water. So I'm a hands-on kind of volunteer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stouffer. Good evening. I'd like to thank the League for this discussion. Um, I've served on the library for over a quarter of a century. Uh, before being elected up to the board in 99, I spent a year on a study committee. And it informed me a lot about library operations and, and board functions. This kind of involvement uh, is a very wise step for anyone interested in governing this institution. My experience on the board, in, I've, I've had experience on the board in every office, which gives me great insight and ability to build this library to what it is today and will become. I know, uh, what I know and apply are strengths that come with experience in life and library business. My style is to be curious and ask, asking and probing questions on library matters and challenging outdated and inappropriate policy positions. This approach helps me to excel at the three main board responsibilities, our budget, our policies, and our director. Having my voice on the library, having my voice in our library conversation continues to make it an even greater jewel in our community. Thank you, Ms. West. Thank you everyone for being here and for the League. Uh, my slogan for this campaign is freedom to read. And I'm running to ensure the freedom to read for the entire Rochester Hills community. I love Rochester Hills. I moved here in 1988. I have a bachelor's degree from Michigan State University. And at that time, I worked as a corporate communications executive. I later went on to get my graduate degree in psychology and have been a clinical um, psychologist in private practice since uh, about, uh, about 12 years now. I volunteered in numerous community and professional organizations. I was appointed by Governor Whitmer to the Michigan Board of Psychology a few years ago. I'm an active leader at my church and was active in the city council's solid waste committee back in the early 90s, which may not be a big deal, but we came up with the idea for the single hauler and recycling plan that we now have that's been very popular. And I was named environmentalist of the year for that work. I'm actually um, a co-author, quite proudly, of a number one best-selling book, um, another award-winning book, and I've been an editor and author of um, several different psychology articles, journal articles, and textbooks and I'm a member of a monthly book club, so I'm an avid reader. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will begin the question part of our forum now. We're gonna start with Ms. Hetrick, and every question will start with the next person. So everybody gets to go first. This is the first question. What is the role of a board member? What isn't the duty of a board member? Uh, the role of a board member, I believe, is um, definitely fiduciary. It uh, manages the money and property um, for the community. Uh, for the library. Um, our, it's visionary to take a look at what the future of the library holds going forward and um, to me that entails uh, looking at what the needs of the community as a whole are. Um, what the, the duties of the board are not um, is to tell the uh, staff, um, the, board, the, the people who work at the library, how to do their jobs because we've hired them to do their jobs and they do a very good job at what they do. It's not our job to tell them what books to curate for the library or anything else like that either. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lawson. Can I have the question, please? Oh. Can I have the question again, please? Yes, the question is, what is the role of a board member? What isn't the duty of a board member? The role of a board member is to govern the library along with its, his fellow board members. Uh, we do not, the only person that we uh, sh choose is the director who in turn directs and chooses other, board, other members of the uh, staff. 
we uh, do not um, have any role in deciding what books should be on the shelf, who should re have access to them. That is not our work. Our work is to uh, monitor the, the financial well-being of the, of the library, to uh, keep the, uh, the needs of it in our primary control and, and interest, and particularly to find ways to make our labor even more successful for the people who use it now. Thank you, Ms. Olson. Board members have a strong interest in the content of all the programs at this library and in the media materials. Board members support educational integrity for all patrons, for all ages. We are not responsible, as Ms. Hetricks already said, for dealing with the staff issues because that's handled so well by our library director. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stouffer. The, the uh, obligations of a board of trustees for a library pretty much boil down to three things, and that is the budget, establishing policy for the library, and hiring our director. Our director then hires all the other employees. As others have mentioned, ours is not to select books, ours is not to make decisions about what programs are put on. We do have a great input into matters such as renovations of the library, uh, building the libraries, building extensions and such. We also do have a role occasionally though in challenges to books. And ultimately, if the staff decides to keep it and a person challenges it further to the board, then the board considers whether the book is appropriately placed within the library or if it should be removed for whatever reason. Fortunately, in our 100 years, we've never banned a book. Thank you, Ms. West. Thank you. Um, from my experience on the Michigan Board of Psychology, and I've had training through that board uh, process and in other leadership roles, I've been trained in policy governance. And policy governance is what a board of trustees is about. Their main role is to set policy up front, not to micromanage, as has been mentioned, um, after the fact, or run the library as another manager. Um, the board's responsibilities include legal compliance, strategic planning, policy making, and fiduciary responsibility has been mentioned. Um, just recently at a board meeting, a board member brought up a, a display that was brought up that was up for Pride Month and had some concerns about that. That's an example of, of perhaps an overstep into micromanaging the responsibilities of the director and the staff and not a, a role of the governance of the, of the policy of the board. And um, so I would encourage us to consider as a board the appropriateness of decisions and, and th that micromanaging where that lies. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna start the next question with Ms. Lawson. We're gonna get right to it. I think that's why people are here. Is there a place in public library to ban books? What is your opinion on book banning? Please share yours. And we'll start with Ms. Lawson. <coughs> Library board members take an oath as they assume office to defend the rights of all people as approved or as, as expected in the uh, U.S. Constitution. Freedom to read is a very important, very important uh, role of, of um, uh, what our, all our community needs and practices. Uh, we should defend the rights of everyone. We never know when a book that we may d disagree with will certainly help someone else possibly. There's a good reason for books to be in the library. So that's really uh, not our job and we don't assume to take it. Thank you, Ms. Olson. As a library board trustee, I have no obligation to promote either the banning of books or the purchase of sexually explicit or graphic material for the children and the youth. I recently ordered two books off Amazon. Can't ban a book anymore. That is a, a myth these days. There isn't anything out there that can be banned or should be banned. But we do have a responsibility to make sure we have appropriate material in the correct places at this library. Thank you. Mr. Stouffer. Likewise, um, banning books is not anything this library has ever done. Um, our responsibility as a board is to support our librarians when they make their choices, although their choices are somewhat limited. 
we have about a third of a million volumes here. So there are choices that are made every day to not bring in other millions of books. That said, um, there's no reason ethnically, religiously, socially to ostracize or prevent any group, any person from requesting material here. As was previously mentioned, there are places where we might consider not having a book in a children's area, but having the same book available in an adult area. So there are circumstances where we might consider placement, but we've never banned a book. Thank you. Ms. West. As I mentioned, my uh, platform is Freedom to Read, so you can guess that I believe that libraries should create collections, programs, and services that meet the needs of the entire diverse community and not restrict those based on claims by the loudest or most extreme members of the community. I oppose censorship and support the First Amendment rights of our citizens um, in, and advocate that we support the uh, advoc uh, critical thinking uh, in the community. I think that uh, we are citizens who can make responsible choices about what we read, that parents can model intelligence and open-minded inquiry for their children and uh, encourage them to read, to cultivate uh, open-mindedness. And I think that's very important for the library to model, that we are a place to encourage expression, a, fr a free expression of ideas. Um, and I think that when we think about some of the books that are being banned or attempted to be ma being banned nationally, this is one of the reasons I ran. I'm very concerned about this issue and um, do not want to be subjected to book banning. Thank you. Ms. Hetrick. Uh, hi. The, the freedom to read, the ability to um, find books that speak to you, I think is a very important idea. I, I picked up some of the words that the library uses on their website, promoting literacy and lifelong learning, connecting people to ideas, respecting the individuality and diversity of all people, valuing the freedom um, to form, to hold, to express individual beliefs, respect all forms by which knowledge is communicated. Um, we, you know, again, I'll get back to the diversity of our community and, and the, the looking at the children I work with and seeing their eyes light up when they do see themselves in books. Um, and I think that goes across the board when it speaks to books being on a shelf. Um, I think our sta library staff does a great job of curating those books and, and doing the job that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start with Ms. Olson. This is another in relation to that same topic. In regards to book banning, should contested books be allowed to stay on the shelf while the book is being challenged? Why or why not? Do you know what your library policy is on this issue and the timeline for a challenge? I do not know the timeline for a challenge because I would be new to the library board and how that works. But a contested book should stay on the shelf and I don't see in terms of the First Amendment why it should not. Um, I would follow the timeline, whatever that time is, and I'm sure the people who are already on the board can speak to that timeline. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stouffer. It's sort of like being innocent until proven guilty. You leave it out there until there is a decision made that might move it or, uh, or, or change it in some way. Um, as for the policy, it varies quite a bit in terms of time because a person may request information about it from our director, then have a conversation with the director, and then openly challenge whether the book should be there, and then if they choose to um, go up to the board, if they don't like the decision that's made, then they, it may take a little bit longer. But it, it, it tends to happen entirely within a couple of months at most. So, Thank you. Ms. West. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the, if you're interested in this idea of collection management, the spring issue of the, the newsletter, the magazine that the library puts out, um, has a very well-written article by the director uh, that explicitly details how collection management is handled, um, who decides, the director decides where to relocate or retain or remove books based on the policy that's set up. and. Um, and yes, the board is the final stop of, of a decision that the book should be removed, and that timeline can vary depending yeah, on, on how all that's handled and the review process for that book. Um, but I want to emphasize that our librarians are masters trained, they're well educated, they follow a protocol for books that are placed on the shelves, they're trained in bias awareness, and they, are, they do not endorse personal or moral or aesthetic viewpoints. And so the books that are brought forward are hopefully representative of a wide range of views that are appropriate for the audience and appropriate for where they're placed on the shelf. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hetrick. Um, I guess I'm going to go with the rest of the 
the, the panel here, and um, I do believe that condensed books should stay on the shelves until um, it has been deemed that they do not belong there because there are, uh, there are possibly people out there who may be reading those books and are interested in keeping them there. It is, again, the, the staff at the library that we have that are trained, um, as Harper also mentioned, in curating those books and having the books there that are needed. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lawson. As mentioned before, th we do have a process, and we follow our, our, our it is our policy INF dot space, space one. If you ever want to uh, look at it, it's right in the uh, the website for you to examine yourself as to what what uh, protocols they follow. It is thoroughly reviewed by each person. It should remain on the shelves until it has been uh, correctly evaluated, and we feel that is a fair way to uh, ensure that that not only is the the issue been raised, and we respect the person who raises it, but that we also review and remind ourselves that we are in really entitled to, or uh, entitling people to question, to uh, decide if they, if the things they are looking for, are truly the uh, what they're expecting. Thank you. We'll start with Mr. Stouffer. In the last few years, we've seen a trend of threats against library staff because of their work maintaining well-rounded collections. In your role as a board member, what can you do to maintain civil discourse and help your staff feel supported against inflammatory rhetoric or harassment? Yeah, that kind of support is, is, is absolutely needed within any organization, but in a public one like this where we affect so many people, um, our staff are, are gems. They um, do the work of the library and we tell them through our board actions, through individual conversations, how much we appreciate and support them. In addition to that though, we also have had drills and training for threats and we've worked with the, uh, the uh, police chief here in Rochester. We have uh, ongoing discussions about how to handle incidents that have come up, whether we can improve on a situation or um, how to address uh, uh, patrons that may um, express their opinions in way too violent a way. Uh, we've been very fortunate that our staff is professional and learn how to de-escalate, but uh, we, we certainly would support them in, in any way we can. Thank you, Ms. West. Yes, this is unfortunate that this uh, civil discourse has, has sunk to this level. Um, certainly the, the staff director and the managers are probably the front line on handling this board again is, is more of a policy governance board and probably should not be involved in specifics, but I could think of perhaps some training in de-escalation de tactics and how to have a civil conversation with somebody who's escalated. As a psychologist, this is something we, we have to deal with on a daily basis in our practices um, and so there are techniques to be used to help listen well to people to, and to de-escalate conversations appropriately, and perhaps the staff could, could benefit from that kind of training um, and, and involvement of the police as necessary would obviously be hopefully very limited. Um, again, I think our board is uh, well aware of this issue, and I'm sure our director is as well. Thank you. Ms. Hetrick. Um, unfortunately, in this day and age, um, we, we do have the problem with threats. Um, working in the schools, um, we deal with it um, on a daily basis, the, the concerns and the fears, and we've had, we've had training, Our, the staff has training, we go through drills, we do things like that, and so I'm, I'm hoping and I'm hoping that along with the training that the staff here at the library has, that if there is additional training to be had, that we can approve those kinds of things. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lawson. Um, I've actually attended some training that we've produced, pr presented to our uh, staff to help them not only protect themselves, but also to look for those clues or, or behavior tendencies that might alert that maybe they need to maybe call someone, maybe call the police. Uh, it, luckily, we have not had an incident that I am aware of where, we, where we've been brought to that point, but I know they're being prepared as a part of our, our annual um, training sessions where we basically close the library for a day and we spend time just dealing with issues that affect our staff, that affect our library in a very deep way. Uh, this has not been overlooked, and I'm very proud of the fact of how much our, 
our um, employees are empowered to know and to act appropriately. Thank you, Ms. Olson. As a, a library board um, candidate, we are entitled to a tour of the library. And one thing that really stood out was how, uh, and, and I personally appreciate how well prepared this building is, this staff really is for challenges and community issues. But I think that after my 30 years of parent-teacher conferences and learning to really de-escalate de the angry mom or dad, I think what may be needed at this library is a community liaison, whether it's a board member or a staff member, to answer, to listen, to talk to whoever it may be, a parent who has a concern about a book or a program, or perhaps a community member who is just dissatisfied in general. And I think that is something that is needed at this library, and I would like to be that person. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start with Ms. West. Should the Rochester Hills Public Library Board pursue forming a district library with Rochester? Oh. Is this enough? Oh, okay. All right, I'll get this eventually. Should, should the Rochester Hills Public Library Board pursue forming a district library with Rochester Hills, Rochester, and Oakland Township? Why or why not? That's a very good question. Um, I, not sure everyone knows, but um, because when I'm out campaigning, there are a lot of questions about this. Rochester Hills has the millage and runs the board and elects this board and runs the library. Oakland Township and Rochester, city of Rochester, uh, can use the library based on a contract system, but they are not allowed to vote for the board and are not actively involved in running it. Um, so they are, we are essentially a district library now. Um, they don't, again, have a governing uh, involvement other than there are liaisons from those two communities on the board. Um, they are non-voting members, but they are um, very active in participating in the board content and discussions. And so we have that as an unofficial district. I don't know that the value of a di the officially fi filing, pursuing that district policy or district library, um, we'd have to look at that and see what the other communities would like to do. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hetrick. I think along with looking at what it would look like to have a, a district library, um, I think we would have to look at the costs involved of, of funding and staffing, um, something like that. Uh, I think it's something definitely that can be looked at, but I think there, are, you know, we can maybe be a little more bit creative. I know there are a number of things that have been looked at, having been to some of the board meetings. Um, as far as at least out in Oakland Township area with uh, possibly lockers and things like that to get. But I think one of the things that I know is that a lot of the people come into this area for a lot of the things that they need and, and those people do come, when they come in they will come to the library. Um, but uh, as far as having a district library, I'm not sure what the benefits of that would be. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lawson. Uh, several years ago, this issue came up at some detail and depth, and we looked at it from all angles, presuming, you know, what, do, what happens if, if we, in a, way, in a way, give to other, uh, our, our, our companion, uh, or I should say our contract, contracted uh, parties, our, uh, the, Oakland, the Oakland Township as well as um, Rochester, the same rights as we have earned through uh, working out, you know, all of this history, just as Rochester Hills. And we were kept running into problems and, and, and reasons where that really were not, it was really not a good idea to explore. One of them was, one of them was that as if a new arrangement or contract was built, there, there was one party that wanted a, an escape clause, so to speak, a way to, abandon it if they don't like it. And then there were other issues that started to come up and we realized this was all going to be much more than we wanted to endure because we are giving the same services to m members of the, these other two communities, Rochester and Oakland Township. There's nothing that, that's uh, held back from that. I'm sorry, your time's up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Olson. Thank you. Uh, I think we should keep Rochester Hills as the main district library because of where it is, partly. I have also attended many of the board meetings, and 
Oakland Township and Rochester have had input, but in particular, I've really been impressed by the Oakland Township input. As such, um, while I would not include a larger district library because people I've talked to said, we go to your library because it's so big. I would like to see the Oakland Township and the Rochester people who come in actually have a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stouffer? Over the last 20 years, I've been a strong proponent of the concept of a district library because this is, in effect, the Rochester Area Library. It serves Rochester, Rochester Hills, and Oakland Township. I'd love to have Oakland Township have a vote. I'd love to have Rochester have a vote. The roadblocks we ran into were more technical. They weren't conceptual. They were how would you elect the board? And there are two ways to do that. Would it be appointed, would it be elected? How would you proportion or apportion the, the, the voting areas, the districts? Um, the, the other one were, were somewhat minor issues, but it ended up just not being contentious, but just getting shelved for a while. We brought it up again about six years later, and we had a similar result. One of the great advantages is as a district library, we get to manage all of our finances, and we don't have to depend on the city of Rochester Hills to put out our bonds or any other financial instruments. So we have complete control over our own finances. Thank you. We'll start with Ms. Hetrick again. What are the specific three things you would incorporate in the library policy strategy or events if you are appointed to the board? So I think specifically, what, what, what would you, is what, library policy or the strategy or events, what specific things could you do? Oh, what are the specific three things you would incorporate in the library policy, strategy, or events if you are appointed to the board? Wow, I think that's a fairly broad question. Um, I, what I bring to the board is my background with um, Authors in April, with children, um, and having the knowledge of being on a board in the past. Um, I'm not sure I know enough at this point to actually say this is what I would like to um, change or institute or bring into it, but I feel that it's important to look at the library going forward and maintain its, um, its, its ability to uh, explore and create and continue to grow in the areas that it's grown in. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Lawson. There are some areas that really need to be expanded, and that is to expand library services. We, we've had a, a, a bookmobile uh, within the last uh, 10, well, almost 20 years, and it has reached a, a wonderful, it has had great acceptance and reached many people. The question is, what do we need to do more? How do we, how do we ex ex explore new ways to reach and help people? Uh, you may or may not be aware that we have uh, a group that, uh, I should say, a service that serves people with, who have issues of seeing, blind people. Uh, and it, we, we are um, successful in that, and, and it's been our, one of our major wins, actually, because so many people depend on these new ways to access the library of materials that they wish to have. Um, the, other, th the other issue that this brings up is maybe we need to have uh, things that just go into these, um, like, like lockers for books that people can access uh, right near their homes, uh, particularly in the further reaches of our, of our community. Oh. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Ms. Olson, your time was up. Ms. Well, part of the tour was looking at all of the areas of the library, and in particular, the children and youth area, which is now very outdated, just needs a structural change and a refresher, you know, a, a facelift, so to speak. So that's one thing that I would recommend as a board member. I already mentioned that I would like to see some position like a community liaison to listen to parental concerns or community concerns. And then finally, marketing has just come to our attention about some of the lesser known programs, I think that needs to be stepped up because reaching these people that she's talking about is so imperative, but not, if people don't know about it, 
we just need to improve the marketing for this library because it's so great. Mr. Stouffer. I think one of the things that we would like to do, and we consider hundreds of changes or additions uh, throughout uh, any one term on the board, is to expand the children's area in, in many ways, either uh, to, to, to create more space, to change the layout, and, and provide more, um, more uh, library materials for children's area. The second one was mentioned briefly is uh, the bookmobile. It is a service that is um, essentially th the best in the state. We have the highest circulation out there. We actually have two bookmobiles right now. We've had several bookmo bookmobiles before, but they have been retired for mechanical reasons. And we're looking at whether we should continue a fleet of small uh, bookmobiles or a larger one. It costs about three hundred to four hundred thousand um, dollars. The, the third item that I would consider, we've already discussed a bit, is the concept of a district library. Thank you, Ms. West. Thank you. Regarding strategic planning, I think the board's strategic plan is very good regarding its core m values and mission, but it has not significantly addressed one issue that I would actively promote and ha has been a platform of mine, and that is an, um, including uh, an environmental sustainability plan in the board strategic plan to reduce environmental impacts and possibly save money. Uh, this has not been addressed that I'm aware of at all. This plan would not mandate change, but would consider environmental impacts in every decision the board or the library staff make. The library has made gradual changes over to LED bulbs and fixtures, um, but the utility bill is $165,000 a year. Where could we save money there? New bathrooms are going to be put in here shortly. Is there a water use feature we should look at to reduce water use? Is there an instant hot water heater that we could be used? The roof needs replacing, $750,000. Is there a solar element that we could add to that to offset some of our utility costs, et cetera? Everything down to the native plants we could possibly be putting in the garden. I think environmental issues are one area the library has not addressed to date. Thank you. All right, Ms. Lawson, Ms. Lawson, you'll start this one. Okay. After visiting several museums in Germany showing Nazi literature and youth propaganda, I am convinced of the need for parents to supervise what their children read. How do you suggest the parents be informed about a book content and message, what the message is? With, the knowledge, with, with that knowledge, how can parents manage what books their child access, accesses? Yeah, that's a really good question. Oh, that's a really good question because um, our concern is that, well, first of all, it's the parents' rep responsibility to be looking at what their, what their children are picking up, which, what they're looking for. Uh, when they come to the library. But secondly, to have some guidance with is actually uh, could be very wise. Uh, again, sometimes people appreciate this type of, of information. Others will feel, well, I, need to, I just do it myself or I, or I follow my own book, my own ideas. So I think we need to address the fact that parent, we all face a very uh, society that is dealing with issues we may not be familiar with from our own younger years. And we need to uh, keep, keep, maybe in our programs, to set some standards that people can feel comfortable with, with when they come take their children here. Thank you. Ms. Olson. Well, she talked about our younger years, and we all come to the library based on what we did with our own youth and with our families and with our moms and dads. Library should be a place of wonder and magic and learning. And the people that I talk to who are, I would say, millennials, Gen Z, they are being very secretive about why they're not coming until we start talking. And they say things like, please don't put those books out. The people that I talk to who have been through the 60s twice say something completely different. Very different attitudes, both, though, coming from fear. And I think that is something we need to address. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stouffer. As for books such as the Nazi ones that were referenced, um, a parent's responsibility is to oversee their children. Obviously, that declines a bit as they get older. 
But we've actually had situations where parents would drop, drop kids off and then leave and come back and pick them up several hours later. We have policies that address that, and we've actually had situations where the kids were here after closing. Parents' responsibility is to be there with their kids, to assist in their selection, to guide them into things that they think are appropriate age-wise, and uh, we can't get away from that. It's an old-fashioned concept, but it's one that works, and it's one that is incredibly important because the parents also then understand better what their kids like, what their kids are looking at, what their kids might want to seek out. So um, not, not in banning, but in having parents involved so the children are safe. Thank you, Ms. West. Um, thank you. I um, know this is a complicated issue because you know parents want to be able to protect their children, but um, as a psychologist, I can tell you that it's not always in the best interest of the child to be overly protected. Um, they need to expand their minds and their thought processes as well. I remember reading many controversial books when I was younger. It didn't turn me into a bad human being, I don't believe. It expanded my mind and made me think and think critically, and I think that's important. Um, children under the age, I believe, of 13 or 14 cannot have a library card without per the parents' per permission and, and consent at this point. So if the parents want to be involved, they certainly can by um, monitoring literally what the children are checking out of the library online now. So it's very easy to do, and um, parents can certainly do that if they'd like. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hetrick. Uh, parent involvement, I think, is, is a must. You, you're, you're, as a parent, um, I know raising children myself, they didn't always read the books that I wanted them to read. They chose their own books, and we had discussions about it. Um, again, our, children grow, um, they learn, we all do, when we read books that take us beyond our, our little circle, our realm of, of what we know. And I think it's important for parents to understand that they have to be responsible for what their children are reading. They have to know their children. Um, I don't think that the library's job is to monitor what the children are reading. That's the parents' job. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start with Ms. Olson. Will you be responsible to uphold the library constitution or policy? That is our job. Plain and simple. Our job is to serve the library and through extension serve the patrons that's our job. Thank you. Mr. Stouffer. And of course, our policies determine how we operate uh, or the guidelines by which you operate. So uh, that is something not only formulated by this board, but by previous boards. So of course, that would be something that the board would try and enforce and abide by. Um, I, I don't think it's any surprise that the, the board that formulated it would want to stand behind it. Thank you. Ms. West. Thank you. Yes, I, I plan to uphold the oath of the uh, Board of Trustees, the Library Board of Trustees position, um, pr pr protecting the First Amendment rights of every patron to have free and open access to library materials. And I promise to serve patrons with free, open, non judgmental access to collections and services, regardless of their age, gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, disability, language profici proficiency, or social or economic status. It's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> yes, I plan to encourage freedom to read, as I said, as my slogan. Thank you, Ms. Hetrick. Uh, yes, I believe as we take the oath um, to do the job that we're supposed to do as, as a board, that that is what we are doing and what we must do to serve the library, which includes the entire community. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lawson. As I said before, we do take an oath to uphold uh, our constitutional rights uh, of all, every person who, uh, who uh, comes to our library. And it's important that we spend uh, time in thinking through our policies, whether they need to be upgraded, which they need to be uh, changing with the times. Um, if we are, as a governing body, have to be open to uh, all of the possibilities that may be confronting our library as we move, for move forward in the future. Thank you. We'll start with Mr. Stouffer. Does your library have a policy for programming? Are you familiar with this document? What would you like to see included in the document? 
We have many policies that pertain to programming, everything from what can and cannot be put on to how many people can attend and what the proper notice is and whether you're a resident or non-resident. So there are, there are many, many, many policies that pertain to um, programming. Um, the, the, the diversity of our programming is just astonishing. The director was just talking about well, we, tomorrow we have 10 programs in the library. Now that's a bit extreme for any one day. Nonetheless, we continue to try and grow that for every segment of our patron population. So what I'd like to see is a continuation of what um, I've promoted for the last 20 plus years and uh, continue to broaden the spectrum of the types of programs that are there. Thank you. Ms. West. I'll defer to the more experienced members of the board regarding the policies. I don't know those specifically, but um, I assume they're well written and well enforced. Um, it does seem like the library has a really great range of, of programs and events, and um, I think they do a good job of monitoring attendance and respond to what is needed in the community based on that attendance and, and what feedback they get from, from people, whether they like the programs or not. And so I think that seems like it's a system that's going well. And again, I think that seems to roll into the role of the director and not into micromanaging um, from the, the board. The board sets the policies and the director and the staff choose those programs. And um, I think it seems like it's going very well. And I wouldn't want to uh, micromanage that from the board level. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hetrick. I have read some of the policies. I haven't gone through all of them. There are a lot. There's a lot of information out there. And again, I will um, say that, <clears throat> excuse me, that the diversity of the programming here at the library is phenomenal. And that's in, you know, thanks and due to the, the staff and their ideas and the things that happen here. And so I think we need to continue on that vein and to support the staff and to continue the program that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lawson. Uh, but one of the best ways for us to determine whether we're, on, we're doing the right thing with our programming is through comment cards that we receive. And each, at each meeting, uh, the board has the opportunity to look at those comment cards to see how well uh, people are appreciating and, and even su suggesting things uh, for the library to explore. Uh, we have so many things that are going on any one year that I'm sure you'd find many things that you would really enjoy doing and, and spending time here. And uh, actually, after a, a program is uh, pre prepared and given, it's available online for you to review so, or to experience. So if you're homebound, if you know someone's homebound, you can very much keep in touch with where the library's doing and many, many of the programs that are being offered. Thank you. Ms. Olson? Well, I've attended many of the programs here at the library, and I'm sure if you're here, you know uh, that there are great programs. But a quick snapshot, if you will, into the actual board meeting about the programming. This is the most collaborative group I've ever seen. You should be very proud of what they've done already. I would love to be a part of that collaboration because that's sort of who I am. But the discussions about the programming are phenomenal. And again, this is why the library is as good as it is. Thank you. Somebody in the audience wants to know, what program at the library have you attended in the last two to three years? Not a board meeting or a library meeting. And we'll start with Ms. West. Um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> I've, I've attended um, a, article, a program about a hiking book I believe <laughs> it's. I'm trying to think if that was within the last two or three years. I have. A, I have to confess. I work in the evenings and on Saturdays because I'm a clinical psychologist and that's when I see patients. So my evenings are pretty much with work. And I have to confess, I don't get out to events like this in the evening or on Saturdays. And it's going to be, a, you know, <laughs> a confession of mine. I don't come to the programs as much as I would like. I see them in the newsletter and they look wonderful. And I just don't get out here as much as I would like to. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hendrick. Well, um, I came to a lot more programs when my girls were growing up, but the, uh, the, the programs that I have been to recently are the uh, Friends events where they've had the authors in April here in the library and brought the authors in, and that would probably be the, the biggest events that I've been to recently. Um, they just had their kickoff meeting here not too long ago, um, very well attended, and so that's, that's where I've been. Okay, Ms. Lawson, 
Uh, the program I'm most familiar to, with is the one that I started 10 years ago. It's called Scribes, and it's a writer's group for adults who are, have inclinations or want input, want to get critique for work, they're working, things they're working on. And it has really been a blessing to, not only to me as a writer, but also to people who have risen from uh, just thinking about a book they want to read to self-publishing and even publish, being published. So um, it's been a very successful uh, effort and continues to be, and uh, I'm just pleased to have been a part of it. So that's my personal input to programs. Thank you, Ms. Olson. Yeah, that's one of the coolest programs <laughs> I think you have. Uh, I came to the Swing Street Band that got pulled from outside, inside, and imagine sitting where you are with a horn right in your face. It was amazing, I was mesmerized. Um, at one of the board meetings, there was a question about an upcoming program on the infrastructure of how water works, and someone said, I wonder who would go to a program like that. I'm like, I would, I would. That's all so down my science road. Um, and I missed yesterday's Chinese tea service because I had a convention for my church, so I do like coming to them. Thank you, Mr. Stouffer. If I had to relate all the programs I have attended here, we'd be here probably till about 11 o'clock. Um, what I tend to do more incognito is drop into different programs at different times, and often the presenters don't even know I'm there, the director doesn't know I'm there, and I just observe, maybe not the entire program, certainly uh, some portion of it, and just to get a feel for what is going on, how many people are there, what the tenor is, just everything about it. It, it makes me better informed as a library trustee to have a little fingers in all sorts of programs. Thank you, we'll start with Ms. Hetrick. Are you a library user? Are you a member of the Friends and aware of what the Friends do? And what changes do you foresee for the library? Um, I am a library user. I am a, a huge reader. Um, so I do use the library. I am a recent member of the Friends and have supported the library in the past, um, you know, through their partnerships with Authors in April and um, with my children over the years. Um, what new things would I like to see? Well, I, I know some of the things that are happening. We talked about the building renovations and some things and expanding some of the areas and looking into things like that. Um, I know they've got the new the Eureka Lab, the makerspace upstairs, expanding things like that in the library is a wonderful opportunity for our community. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lawson. I, actually, I'm um, very pleased that we have such a wide variety of, of opportunities for people. Uh, basically, what I would suggest is, um, and really, makerspace is just such an amazing thing. I'm just so proud of, of what we have scribes as, as an alternative. And I would suggest that maybe there are other, other areas of our creativity that would benefit, like uh, programs for uh, budding artists or people who are interested in, in uh, theater or even uh, producing things uh, on stage. So there's, there's whole new areas that we haven't really explored it might be an, an, a very important thing for people. Thank you. Ms. Olson. Sorry. Thanks, um, I am a member of the library. I am a future member of the Friends of the Library. So put that in our uh, cap. Um, I just drew a blank. Can I have the question again? I'm yeah, uh, what are the changes that you see for the library? Well, I think we've kind of covered a, that in, in general, some of the changes that we'd all like to see. Um, I have been to the makerspace, and I made a, a, a coaster of the wood-burning thing they have upstairs, where you get to sit at a computer and design your artwork, and then you're not allowed to look at the laser while it burns your artwork. I could have stayed there all day. I've worked with 3D printing, that's a phenomenal thing. And again, no, I was the only one in there. So I think the changes I would make is, again, as I've already said, better marketing for these really cool things that we're doing here. Thank you. Mr. Stouffer. Our friends at this library are a phenomenal organization. I have traveled the United States, and I typically will stop at libraries wherever I go. And discussions that come up about our friends leave them slack-jawed. The amount of money they raise for us, 
the efforts they put forward, the, the intensity with which they manage our book sales is just it's, it's beyond what most people can even start to think of. They have donated millions of dollars to this library in my tenure, and they continue to do so. They expand our book sales every year. They have a wonderful store that we expanded for them several years ago, and uh, it, is, it is an organization that is um, without par in this uh, part of, of, of the United States. Thank you, Ms. West. Yes, I am a library user. As I said, I'm in a book club, so I love the fact that I can either get the hard copy or a digital copy. It's, it's wonderful. Um, and, and get library loans from other libraries. I am not a member of the Friends, as in I'm, I'm overscheduled now, I think, quite a bit with my volunteer and work and uh, various activities, but they do, do, do wonderful work, as Chuck said. Um, the changes to the library that I would like to see, I mentioned an environmental sustainability plan. Uh, as we move forward with uh, renovations and improvements to this 30-year-old building, which is hard to believe. Um, I want to ensure that there's flexible space uses because we need more you know, kind of third space uses for our, our students, for our remote workers, for community groups, for social needs in this you know, age of loneliness, this pandemic of loneliness that we have. Uh, literacy promotion continues to be an issue that the library has worked on and I think we need to continue to do with 50% of the U.S. population reading at less than a sixth grade level. Our non-English speaking community needs to be continually addressed and um, just continue to work to... Sorry. Um, Time's up. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Just going to finish that thought. I'll finish the thought. Okay. Um, we're going to start with Ms. Lawson. What will you do for the youth in promoting, and it says intellectual intelligence. I'm not sure that I know what that is, but that's the question. <laughs> What, what yes. Will, what, will, what will you do for the youth in promoting intellectual intelligence? Well, this becomes a part of our programming, doesn't it? Because we need to... Microphone. Microphone. I have, aren't I being heard? Okay. Um, it, it should be a part of our, our concepts of what we offer them in terms of books about it and uh, programs about it. And then again, what level are we approaching a youth? Is it a high school level? Is it before that? I think this is such a new um, thing to be considering. I'm not sure whether too many people know where, where do we, uh, we start with, with people, uh, in young people. So I would explore that. Maybe that takes, takes a matter of some of adults to look at. Thank you. Ms. Olson. Uh, just a quick personal story, I had um, a small library where in, in my small hometown where I grew up in Illinois. But when I was in the library, I had a personal relationship with a librarian who understood that even as a four and five year old, I needed to be reading much higher level books. And I continued that relationship because it was a smaller community and my family knew this person. Is that possible? Of course it is. It's possible in any library but it may take a training program to get the libraries to identify those kids. It may be a um, liaison with teachers in the community saying, hey, librarians in the public library, we've got this kid. How can you help this person? Working with the parents, absolutely the parents know what their kids need. But let's, let's step up to that plate. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stouffer. What the library provides in terms of children's programming is, is quite extensive. Um, as we go through from the, the very youngest to, to say high school age, uh, there, there are many programs that are provided for them, but we also take a lot of input from parents and adults and schools as to what other kind of programming might be appropriate or interesting or just off the wall. Um, I, I, I see what our our uh, librarians produce in terms of programming, and I think the director can always uh, could attest that I'm always asking why can't we do more, and so um, th there's there's an infinite variety of programs that kids could have, and to stimulate their imagination and to keep them curious is going to be a lifelong benefit. Thank you, Miss West. I am not an educator. I'll be very clear on that. Um, I am curious and inquisitive myself, and love to read, but. Um, who, how to go about promoting intelligence in the youth is way beyond my pay grade. I'll leave that to the librarians and the educators among us. <laughs> um, I, think, I've, I think we all can perhaps think back to memories of our, our youth in the libraries and how 
hopefully they were welcoming, right? That's something we can certainly do. Make sure the service and the attentiveness to this that the staff gives makes the library uh, demystified and welcoming to students so that then they are inclined to read and, and participate in the programs. And I think just creating a sense of awe and intellectual curiosity is just the role of the library. But again, how that goes, uh, goes out into the into the world i'll leave to the librarians to do thank you thank you miss hetrick um, one of the things that this library does i believe is that every student um, in the rochester community school district automatically has a library card here at the public library and i think that is a phenomenal way to get children down here into the library that they have the ability to be here um, and and, and you know, having been in the youth room and having looked at what they have in there, um, we're continually, they are continually updating and upgrading and, and bringing more in. And you talk about the makerspace upstairs, um, intellectual intelligence, it just continues to grow and I'd love to see that continue. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start with Ms. Olson. What previous experience do you have in management of a nonprofit or administration of a nonprofit? Uh, well, in 2011, I retired from the school, public school system in Troy. And I, a week later, I enrolled in a, a program to become a personal trainer. Yes, I did. And so I was in school for 18 months, and at the end of that, I stepped out my graduation and set up my own LLC, started my own business um, to become a mobile personal trainer, which I have to tell you, as soon as the pandemic hit and all the gyms closed, guess who they called? So it was really good for business, not that the pandemic was good, but I was able to help a lot of people through that LLC. So I have a lot of experience in that sort of smaller business setting. I think that's all I'm gonna say about that. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Stouffer. Well, 25 years working in this non-for-profit has uh, taught me a lot, and it is incredibly rewarding. Um, I've had other ventures in a variety of other areas where uh, I've uh, managed uh, organizations and uh, owned my own businesses uh, for many years. Um, at one time, I was the deputy personnel director for the city of Rochester Hills and then became the acting director. So I've had management experience in many levels, and uh, it, uh, it, it serves as a great benefit in understanding how a library operation actually works. Thank you, Ms. West. Uh, thank you. As I briefly said in my bio, um, I came from a history of working in the corporate world, so it was not nonprofit, it was profit, but um, was an executive in uh, corporate marketing and public relations and advertising, and mostly in healthcare, um, hospitals, so somewhat nonprofit, although. Uh, <laughs> Still made a lot of money there, the businesses did. Um, I was a nonprofit manager as a director of the International Association of Business Communicators when I was a corporate communication specialist. Um, it had a very small budget and very small staff, but it was still a nonprofit. And I ran my own business as um, a, a consultant in the corporate communications world. Um, and so most of my experience is going to be a little more on the profit side um, rather than the nonprofit side. Thank you. Ms. Hetrick. Um, as I said in my opening, I was on the Authors in April board for 20 years. Um, and during that time, um, I was on a committee to, uh, we, had, we needed updates to our bylaws, and I was on the committee that helped to do that. So I, I learned an awful lot about uh, the bylaws and the processes of doing that. Um, it was also a 13-member board, and so I w learned uh, to have civil discussions with disagreements when we, you know, we, not that you would think when, you know, of course you're looking for authors and you're dealing with things. We, you know, with the schools and everything else. But it's, it's learning to work with people and work together in a way that is um, conducive to having things move forward in a good way. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lawson. Uh, my only experience before working with the library basically was in the hospital industry. And, uh, I, it was it was a commitment, and I saw the commitment in the people who worked with me. Uh, I was in public relations. I got to find an, uh, find out stories of people who are exceedingly brilliant as well as caring, and I found that was the thing that I wanted to follow through within the rest of my life experience as a worker, because when you have that experience of helping other people, and and really not thinking about your bottom line first. 
it makes such a difference in your quality of your own life and your own personality. And reaching out to people is very important to me. And I think we do that in a great way uh, at the library. Thank you. We're going to start with Mr. Stouffer. Why do you think you should be elected to the library board? My passion for the library, my experience at the library, my life, my what I bring to the discussions, I think are, are, are second to none. Um, grew up in South America, came back here, have a different perspective on, on how we view America. I have been a library user as a parent, as a student, and then as a parent and as a grandparent. Um, find it a great privilege to be able to move this organization forward, expand it, make it the best it can be, and um, got that in me not only through my own passion and interest for books, but my father served on the board for 12 years before I did. So long discussions there about library matters informed me well before being on the board. That experience is uh, vital to uh, having um, a good operation. Thank you. Ms. West. Thank you. Um, I believe that I bring a diverse experience both in the corporate world um, and my experience in policy governance on the Michigan Board of Psychology uh, brings an awareness of policy governance uh, procedures and parliamentary rules of order which are important when you're running a board or serving on a board such as the library board. Um, I know how to handle interpersonal conflict well uh, because of my experience as a psychologist. I actually know child development needs because I work a lot with ch children and youth in my practice and some of the issues regarding book banning are about what is appropriate for a child to read and perhaps I could offer some insight there. And um, again, as a, in the corporate world, I was involved in you know, strategic planning and budgeting, administration, management issues that uh, I hope would be helpful. And I bring a love of books and a love of this library, which I think we all do. I'm sure here that's not going to be a, a novel thing, so to speak, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> but um, I do, do love walking in the library and getting that sense of, of excitement and curiosity and awe that we probably all do. Thank you. Ms. Hetrick. Um, passion. Passion is a good word. Passion for the community. Passion for moving the library forward. Uh, having the experience on the Authors in April uh, board and everything that entailed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the passion for the diversity of this community. Working with children um, at the elementary level gives me that insight into um, what they gain as they read. Um, so, I, you know, as far as just being elected to the board, it, it, it's the library is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lawson. I think the quality that I bring to this library board is creativity, a passion for, not I using that same word, but it's really concern for what is needed in our community, and uh, basically approaching it every program, every possible subject or problem from the point of view of what else can we do for, for this community to help people and who have needs. Uh, we, are, uh, we are certainly broad-based. We, uh, we represent something for everyone if they would only come and take part in it, and that's our job to do it. And I try to find creative ways, because of my public relations background, my interest in, in community to achieve that. Thank you, Ms. Olson. Well, this may surprise you, but I am not on social media. I'm not on Facebook, don't have a Twitter account, don't use Instagram, don't know how. This library is a place of lifelong learning. Social media can't touch what this library has to offer. And being with the people that I've had the honor of being with just because of this campaign has made me realize that that's where we need to be is either out in the community or have the community here. That's what's important, our people, and that's why I want to be on the board. Thank you. We're going to start with Ms. West. This is the last question. Please tell us about a particular book that has impacted your life or how you developed your love of reading. Well, given my name, you can probably guess the answer I'm going to give, that my name is... <laughs> 
similar to a very famous book. Um, I was born the same year that the book won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, Harper Lee wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, and so I'm certainly going to land on that book um, as one that I feel attached to, and I believe is a wonderful book um, and extremely well written. Um, even though my namesake, but um, so that book has influenced me obviously for issues of racial justice and uh, oppression and equality that have influenced my view on the world, um, been involved in politics and been involved in progressive issues for many, many years in my life including environmental justice and I think that has been informed by that book among many others. And I think there was other parts to the question. <clears throat> How you developed your love of reading? Oh gosh, my love of reading. My, my parents were readers. My father was a university professor. There were books and, and uh, numerous encyclopedias in the li in the and we went to the library constantly. Thank you, Miss Hetrick. Oh, so many books. Um, hard to pick one. I, I guess I'm going to take the tack of when I was younger. Um, the the books that impacted me and I, I, I don't know how to pick between them because um, there were two and they were gifts. One was The Velveteen Rabbit and the other one was The Secret Garden. And those two books really spurred my love of reading and took me into those worlds of imagination and where books can take you. And I think that's so important that we, we teach children to get that out of books. Um, so many children spend so much time on um, games and things like that on electronics um, and, and it's so fun I know just when I'm re reading with kids at school to see their faces light up when they read books that really touch them thank you thank you the secret garden was also mine I <laughs> really. Uh, Miss Lawson I think my favorite book was the last one I probably just read because I there's just so many and I, they made so much such a difference in my life uh, my love of, of reading and writing really began as a seven-year-old when I stepped aboard a, a Detroit Public Library bookmobile that came to our community, uh, my, my neighborhood. And it seemed like there were stories of, of children who were, who were brave and they solved problems and mysteries, and uh, many of them were girls. And it gave me the idea that I too could achieve my dreams and, and be more than I would even imagine. And it all began with the library. It's, it's been from the beginning of my life to right now, where uh, I needed some information about health, health for myself. And I found a book. Of course, it opened a whole, whole new number of, of ideas. So I'm, I'm grateful to libraries. Thank you. Ms. Olson. I'm currently reading a book called Revolutionary Women, which I picked up uh, this uh, spring in Colonial William, Williamsburg, and uh, it is an interesting story because it talks about, because don't people love to talk about the book they're reading? <laughs> it talks about women from all different parts of the Revolutionary War, not just the wives of the generals, but the slaves and what happened to them, the women who became spies, the women who became soldiers and hid the fact that they were women. And there's so much more to this book, I can't wait to finish it, but it, as far as the love of reading, it's the reason I became a teacher, is because I loved to read. And I, I wound up teaching a subject where the kids had to read a lot. Have you seen the size of an AP biology book? <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Mr. Stouffer. My parents inculcated us with curiosity and exposed us to things in the world that um, I, I dare say many have never even considered. And I continued down that path in exploring science fiction and encyclopedias and every type of reading you can imagine. That's continued through my adult life. I typically read one to two books a week. Um, my favorite book is a little book, maybe a quarter of an inch thick, called The Little Book on the Human Shadow. And if you ever get a chance to read it, it's worth it at any stage of your life. Thank you very much. That concludes the time for questions. The candidates will now be given one minute for a closing statement in reverse order of opening statements. And we will begin with Ms. West. Well, thank you very much to the League, the volunteers here um, who make this all happen. 
And thanks to the audience for their time and attention and wonderful questions. Um, I hope my answers tonight have shown you that I bring some skills and experiences to the library and the library board. Um, certainly experience in policy governance from my state licensing board uh, membership and numerous leadership positions in business and volunteer organizations, experience in strategic planning and budgeting, and mostly I think though I bring good intentions. I bring an intention to make decisions in support of the library's mission and in the community's best interest without a political or religious or ideological agenda. I hope we can bring this library into its next 100 years um, by ensuring the freedom to read for everyone. And I ask for your vote on November 7th, or actually there will be um, early voting here in this room uh, for the first time, I believe for nine days before the election. So you can take advantage of that new option. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Mr. Stouffer. As you've noted throughout this evening, there were a lot of opinions, a lot of interests, and with that, the experience of having gone through those interests and experiences for 20 plus years is invaluable for the library. Bring that experience to the table and having an open mind to innovation and to the community makes for a clear decision on November 7th. Having my voice on the board has been important and I dare say it's been somewhat unique amongst board members and it gives great diversity of opinion at our board meetings. I envision a greater library that serves the entire community, keeping that approach builds on our history of responsible decision making, prudent spending, broadening of our vision to what the library can be. I've been here at the library for decades and I would hope that you would provide me with your support in November. Thank you. Ms. Olson. The library has a rich history to each person here tonight. As your next Rochester Hills Public Library Board Trustee, my role is to honor your history. I will conclude with two quick concepts, elbow grease and bucket lists. Elbow grease is the concept of working harder for a goal. I learned this as a child. It is intrinsic to my work ethic. Bucket lists embrace the concept of doing things you've always dreamed of doing before your adult responsibilities got in the way. I had a bucket list item of, completing, of competing in the Olympics as a power lifter. Four weeks ago, I got my first medal. Senior Olympics, Michigan, but still, I'm starting. Looking ahead to the future, my bucket list starts here as your next trustee. I believe after serving as your board trustee, let's say six years from now, you will say, I'm glad I voted. I'm glad I put my vote behind the voice I want heard at board meetings. I'm glad I voted for Pamela Olson. Thank you. Ms. Lawson. My husband was a board member before me, and he felt as I did, it's both a an honor and a privilege to serve the people of this community on the board. I take my responsibility seriously to support the library, the information needs of our patrons, and your right to read. Board members must take an oath to, uh, to defend the Constitution when they begin their terms. They pledge to support equal rights for everyone, not just those who agree with their personal beliefs. Before you cast your vote, you also have a duty. Consider what the candidates re represent and how that affects your constitutional rights. If you honor me with your support, I promise to continue to advance the great work of our library for the benefit of our community and defend your right to read. I'm Madge Lawson. I ask for your vote to reelect me on November 7th, and I thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. Ms. Hetrick. The library resources open up worlds that will help us grow and change. One day, the children that use the library will do great things, possibly even change our world for the better. My goal is to ensure we continue the Rochester Hills Public Library success story. A vote for Terry Hattrick is a vote for a library that serves the whole community and continues to grow with the community in the coming years. Thank you for being here. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. The League of Women Voters would like to thank the audience, the candidates, Julian Morian, and the Rochester TV people for making this forum possible. This presentation is copyrighted 2023 by the League of Women Voters. All rights are reserved. Any recording of this forum can only be shown in its entirety. Rebroadcast of this forum will be on the LWVOA website and on YouTube. The League of Women Voters is funded by contributions from concerned businesses and citizens. 
Our membership is open to men and women over the age of 16. You are going to be having to choose between the five candidates, only two, that you can vote for on November 7th. Remember to vote on November 7th. Democracy is not a spectator sport. Please vote. <laughs>